Good day. Good morning. Yep, loud and clear. Thank you. Part on that, it's a, yeah, it's a cherry blue mechanical keyboard. I, I don't dare use it at work, so use it at home. I just posted the link there to the attendance uh, for everyone's convenience. All set, just give a couple more minutes to hit critical mass and then we'll get underway. Okay, so welcome. Good day, everyone. I'm just going to go up to the attendance, see if there's any updates. Okay, looks like we got a few here. All right, so before we go forward, is there anyone that's able to step in as a scribe to take meeting minutes today? Any takers? All right, I'll just monitor the chat and see uh, if anyone is able to step in as a scribe for today to take the meeting minutes. Uh, until then, uh, we're just going to go through our general check-in and the usual workflow as per normal. I'm just going to see if we got anyone here from any working groups or SIGs does not appear to be the case. Ah, thank you, Stephen. Are there any members here? Is there anyone in attendance today from a special interest group or from a working group that has any updates? Uh, no updates, but the policy working group, I think, is meeting this afternoon. OK, thank you.
Okay, so then we'll just move on to our general stand up oh, here. We got a Ma Matthew. Here. I have I have a, a quick update. Sorry. By all means. Probably um, mute. So. Uh, kind of debated whether uh, how much I wanted to, to share, um, but uh, I just wanted to sort of uh, you know, put it out to, to everybody and, uh, um, you know, tech leads that uh, um, I haven't heard from Sarah and JJ uh, for a few days, a little bit worried. Uh, Sarah was stuck in Boston and beginning to get ill um and jj is stuck in india and beginning to get ill um so i've been trying to coordinate a couple of things with uh, my co-chairs and um you know they've been largely offline um you know since they are in sort of non-traditional places um you know uh, uh Anyway, uh, so uh, the, the upshot of that is uh, if you are um, waiting for, for anything uh, from either of my uh, fellow co-chairs, um, I haven't heard from them either. Uh, I do hope that they're all right, and uh, I don't have any uh, further information, but if, if you have needs uh, that aren't getting fulfilled, um, you can uh, you know, reach out to me and I'll uh, uh, continue to coordinate. So uh, apologize uh, for the whole craziness around this and uh, I will uh, um, share back in Slack, um, you know, in the Sig Security uh, channel once I, I hear from them and have any sort of uh, general updates on uh, you know, how they're doing. Gotcha. Thank you, Dan. Um, I do have an update as well. Um, so uh, the harbor assessment and things like that are beginning to start. We have the people and uh, the statements have been signed off on. Um, so everybody has gone and done that. Um, I've just gone ahead and uh, approve the reviewer conflicts although dan i'd feel more comfortable if you just looked at it um i have the most non actually um plausibly even listable sort of conflict in that i um in that notary is used uses tough which is used and notary is used inside of harbor so therefore somehow technically i've worked on harbor but not really um, so <laughs> I think, uh, you know, but I don't think there's any real cause for concern. Uh, so just maybe take a, take a glance at, at that. Um, and we're looking forward to, <coughs> to kicking off that assessment. So thanks to everybody who's volunteered and started to do part of that. Great. Thank you. So we have that uh, check-in from you, Justin, as well as from you, Dan. And then we have two additional ones, one from Robert and one from Bolesla, if I got that correct. Uh, um, Robert, since you're at the top of the list, uh, do you want to go for it? It's GHI number 273. Yeah, so this is the Falco assessment. Um, we had a, I joined the Falco community uh, meeting this morning and the project uh, team there expressed high interest in continuing with the assessment process. Um, uh, so much so that they they actually will gate their 1.0 Falco release on completing the assessment. So I, I, that showed, I think, pretty strong commitment. Um, that said, the flip side is they, they don't have a resource identified to step in and, and actually be the project point of contact. Um, so, I, you know, I'd, I'd wanted to raise the issue maybe later in the discussion here. Um, you know, is there some mechanism by which CNCF might be able to sponsor or provide some sort of, you know, project-based uh, granting or, you know, internship or something. But, um, uh, you know, I don't know if there's a way that CNCF can support projects that are, you know, have high will, but, but low resources to complete the process. So that's just, maybe we can take that up later in the call. 
Justin, do you want to comment on that? I don't see Amy. Um, you know, I, I know that uh, in other Linux Foundation um, um, <coughs> foundations that I'm a member of, um, you know, that's uh, you know much more uh, consideration, and in yet another, uh, it's uh, unthinkable. So <laughs> I, I'm actually not not sure where the CNCF uh, lands on that one. Um, I think also, it would be hard to do this. Like you can't just throw an intern who's yeah, that's what, do this that's what I was going to say. It needs to be someone who knows the project. I don't see how that would really be feasible. And I think that, yeah, there, there are potentially one off um, bits of resource for things with the CNCF, but I'm just not sure how, what the request would really be for that would be meaningful. Right, you know, I, I could uh, just put sort of, uh, you know, names uh, and project a bit in, into this, um, you know, a Chris Nova who doesn't have, you know, sponsorship, uh, but is, is uh, available to, you know, um, wrap things up would be conceivable. Um, I can't see um, you know, a unidentified resource, you know, coming out of left field, uh, you know, getting sponsored and basically hired into, uh, you know, doing something like this. Um, is, is there, uh, any sense that, the, that, uh, an individual, uh, is already available and it just requires funds or no, you know, does no. the, the individual need to be found? No, I think the problem is that the, the individual does not exist. And I, I, I think that okay. the kind of the notion of, like you say, like an internship might be to go out and kind of broaden the recruiting effort and say like, you know, kind of Google summer of code style. If you want to work on this, say over, you know, a summer or three month project, you know, you could really dig in, um, you know, get- but, I mean, that is, a, that is an open summer of code, CNCF right now um so potentially that um i don't know when the period where the students choose the projects is i guess it's not yet so that's possible okay and that maybe the maybe that's the the avenue to try it's just literally the, the google summer code and I, I, I mean you can do this but i feel like um yeah once again like this isn't like a um fill out a TPS report sort of thing. Mm -hmm. This is, um, you know, th this is like somebody who deeply understands and is deeply involved in the project needs to give us information so we can do a meaningful assessment. Yeah, and it's not a huge yeah. amount of work, like time-wise. So uh, yeah, it, it's weird to me <laughs> like there's two very conflicting statements. One is that they care a lot about this and are waiting to hold up a release for it. But the other is, is that no one wants, like, feels like it's important enough to do it. I don't, I don't know if that, I don't know if it's that they don't feel that it's important enough. I, I don't think any one person there felt um, that they could be a good representative. Um, but I can probe deeper into that. Um, I also think that they are, you know, one, one thing that came up is that they're, you know, they're actively fixing existing security issues, some of which are not. Falco issues per se, their kernel items that, that Falco in a sense has uh, discovered, but that they have to create some workarounds or whatnot. So I think there's, there is that and that folks that probably do have the security chops to participate are actively working on high criticality, vulnerability or other security issues. So it's kind of this trade off of, you know, do I do more security review or do I fix the things that we already know about? Um, and that, you know, familiarity is more important than security expertise. So we, we would be perfectly happy with someone who understands the system well, but isn't really a security guy. Mm -hmm. Chase, did you want to jump in on this? Because I, I, I very much, uh, agree with, um, you know, your concerns about, uh, 
you know, not just resourcing now, but, you know, if this is a signal on, um, you know, project participation moving forward that we shouldn't listen to as well. I can add my two cents. Assume you can hear me. I'm in a, I'm in a different room, so I feel like I'm echoing like a bolt. But uh, so, background is uh, I obviously work for an open source project itself. We do lots of things like this as well, sort of in our own dimension. Um, if if a project can't muster muster the resources uh, to facilitate a review. Typically, we just assume that it won't be able to muster the resources to maintain maturity enough to make the review worth our time. So for, for my team internally, it's a self-protection mechanism. There are lots of people who uh, would like that uh, credential or credibility, um, but unless it comes with sort of opposing resources to us, um, we found that it's typically a black hole or uh, you know, a flip flop, right? They say things, we say things, and it just it's a it's a it's a low friction drag over a long term. Um, and as far as sort of pulling in GSOC or we do another thing like GSOC, um, that's not really a force multiplier in this sense. Um, GSOC people are typically, you know one to three years of experience and they're maybe really motivated but they lack depth and you can take three month engagement and really make it something that you could accomplish in four to six weeks tops um that's the general uh, rule of thumb that we operate under but that four to six weeks of additional manpower you're going to subtract maybe two to three of you so the whole GSOC engagement gains you two weeks of a person with one to three years experience, which is fine, right? If you're looking to further things, and I don't, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole further other than to say that's that's not much of a value add here. I would just pause the whole thing. I mean, my thought on it is I don't know if we're uh, flagging graduation based on a particular commit. That seems like we're not, right? Everything is more or less rolling release. Um, but if they aren't at a stopping point uh, where they're ready to walk through the process, then you sort of have multiple vectors of of lack, right? Of falling short. So for this, me, it seems like this is for graduation. What is it for? I'm sorry. As far as I'm aware, they've not applied for graduation. I'm a, I think someone mentioned a 1.0 release, um, but I don't think they're intending to apply for graduation at this point. Uh, I was just assuming that's the sort of mountaintop, right? Whether they've put on their hiking boots or not. But uh, so yeah, I would I would just pause the thing until everybody's ready. That's my thought. That's good feedback. I'm also I'm also thinking that. Uh, Maybe they, they want first to fix their existing vulnerabilities, as you said, Robert, and they feel that, uh, I mean, it's normal that you want to clean your house when you invite someone, someone who inspect it. Uh, and my second thought is that maybe it's good to not push them and uh, just wait for them to approach us when they want uh, and when they feel that they are ready. I mean, I think because this is a cooperation and, and I think this is the right way to do it I agree it should definitely not be a push from us and and i tried to articulate that on the, the discussion this morning that you know we weren't pushing any agenda or any timeline or anything like that um so i agree with you martin okay is there any more on this one? If not, we'll move on to Blaise Law and pardon me if I didn't get there. I had one just additional um, thing, which is uh, for our sort of um, foundation internal assessments of this ilk, uh, we, we have a thing we call a requester service. And uh, you have to basically have all of the information uh, ready to go in order to initiate the process. It would seem maybe 
there is a, um, not a common understanding on sort of where they need to be in order to step through. Like a request for service would involve uh, a designated liaison, and if there isn't one, then there is no request for service. So I don't. I've seen what uh, is submitted, sort of, but I don't know. If maybe that needs some additional information or some additional sort of uh, copy or introduction to set expectations. That's all. Thanks. Well, it, it was delayed. I think because it was originally going to take place earlier, and then um, uh, there was, for various reasons it was delayed. So I think it maybe there's a, some. And in these times, I can see there's also leeway with people not being available. So I, I'm not sure that that's entirely fair, but yeah, let's just wait until they are ready. Sounds good. Okay, thank you. Everyone. Moving on to Boisla on GHI number 372. Good day. Yeah, so that's, that's just for awareness. So um, oh. It's Wednesday. I lost track of time. Yeah, so yesterday I opened uh, again a submission of Kiko to CNCF as a sandbox project. Uh, and together with this, I opened the assessment issue for SIG security. For those of you who remember the whole story, Kiko originally applied like June 2018. We were scheduled to present to TOC October. Literally two hours before the meeting, we got dropped from the agenda with the feedback that uh, TOC is rethinking the whole submission process. Then we finally presented April 2019, if I recall correctly. And then it was moving slowly. Then SIG surfaced. And actually back last summer, I was emailing with Sarah and I even created the initial self-assessment document. And it was even scheduled at some point with Brandon step, stepping up to edit, uh, but then IBM acquired Red Hat and Brandon took a step back because he had conflict of interest to edit. And then we knew that the whole process gets re-engineered and the elections are coming. So I kind of put a halt on all of this. And you know, as processes, new processing is in place and elections happened, I want to reapproach the topic with some, you know, refreshments and improvements. So I created the, the, the issue with the new template and I created the self-assessment document. One interesting factor is that also last November we had a proper pen testing happening, sponsored by one of the end user companies. So not even by Red Hat, I also linked to the report. Uh, so yeah, I know there's a queue and there's a set of priorities. So just, you know, mentioning that that's, 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 addition to the queue. Okay. Well, hopefully that should make the process a lot more seamless. Uh, you know, I, I know that um, this process hasn't always been smooth and things in open source rarely are. So um, believe me, uh, you know, it's, you know, there's there are other people that have felt a lot of frustration too with different things, but of course we're all just doing the best we can. Yeah, well, I, I'm I'm joining those meetings not not all not only because of Kikok. I want to engage in anyway, even if Kikok fails. So I, I witness what's happening and how it's rolling. So I I appreciate all, all the efforts for everyone involved here, but I I, I fully understand all the the whole context and all the hard, hardness of this. Okay, thank you. Are there any other points on this topic? Okay, thank you. Moving on, we have next up presentation by Mark Underwood on Scaled Agile Framework Operator Guidelines. Good day, Mark. Don't seem as muted, but I don't hear audio coming through, Mark. Yeah, I forgot to hit the button. Now it's on me. All right, let's see. Let's see if I get the screen right here. Looks good.
Okay, is it showing the navigator screen or the good screen? Uh, it shows sort of like a um, top navigator okay, so slide and okay. slide. All right, let me see if I can switch it. How about now? Is that better? There we go. Okay. Now yep. yep. Okay. All right. So uh, I've embedded a fair amount of background on scaled agile. Um, do, should we take a vote on uh, whether everybody already knows this and I should zoom by this? I'm going to assume you don't unless you say otherwise. Okay. And it's a safe assumption, especially uh, you know, since we're recording this and, you know, for folks who may come back and review this, uh, you know, having that context will be helpful. Great. So Scale Agile is a open source but commercial framework that's uh, got its roots in a number of other things. So uh, the point of this, uh, really, this presentation was to consider kind of a sub-sub aspect of the scaled agile framework in which we uh, we're mainly considering uh, the issues around uh, oper operations and the specific notion of operations that I focus on here is the ops that we run into in DevOps. But it turns out there's a lot of supporting information to share in this presentation that is going to seem like it has nothing to do with that. So bear with me while I try to go through this. So here's some Disclaimers, I'm, I'm ripping off slides and uh, uh, illustrations from the Scaled Agile people, so apologies for that. Um, also, I put a little uh, music symbol next to the stuff that's my opinion, so you can separate the stuff that I'm borrowing from the Scaled Agile people, because uh, that's intermixed in here with quite liberal um, self-permissioning. So uh, the way that I see this, Scaled Agile is built from, and they describe it this way too, Lean, Agile, and DevOps, and it's all really pretty good mix of that stuff. Um, they mentioned model-based system engineering, but that's pretty lightweight. They don't mention composable services, but I think that's really a major part of it that ought to be considered. And of course, the bigger legacy, probably going back four decades, is object-oriented programming, and a big lacing over all of this of uh, the quality movement, the plan, do, check, act cycle. Some people know this is the Deming cycle. And uh, institutional practice around ISO 9001, which goes back to the mid 80s or so. So uh, this is the only time I'm going to show this diagram, although we can zoom back to this. There's, uh, you can see these on the public website for them. Uh, there's uh, what you see up here in these various tabs are even more detailed implementations of this process in which they try to uh, explain how they implement uh, the Agile process, which, you know, the, the core thing is uh, daily uh, stand-ups, scr the Scrum process, um, trying to decompose the work into small pieces and uh, working with small teams, writing stories, and trying to educate one, one another about how to collaborate across teams. So in the Scaled Agile framework, there's a bigger process of how to orchestrate across the smaller teams. So you see this in this thing called the ART, which is their Agile release train. So that is a sequence of multiple teams working together on projects. And yes, you should be asking yourself when you see this, Wait, how does this work for CNCF? Um, also, I think we're talking about here, which we'll see on successive slides, is the notion of enablers. So I'm interested in where security and privacy fit into uh, enablers when uh, people in sprints are trying to do system demos so that uh, constituents can see what interim products are going to, going to produce. I have probably more slides than we have time for, so I'm going to go through this with some speed. So the principles that they uh, that the the architects of this thing, which is a company based in Colorado, by the way, uh, is kind of interesting stuff. And if you look at it, it's kind of not software engineering, uh, which probably tells you a lot. It's 
it, it's an attempt to try to import concepts from outside of software engineering, but apply it to what is really a release-driven uh, notion. Now, that's a comfortable thing for most of the people on the call here, unless you happen to work in the ops community. Uh, so the ops community could be somebody in the data center, it could be somebody in our JSOC, it, you know, in my day job company. Uh, it could be uh, a person uh, doing pen testing. It could be just about anybody who's not got clear milestones and sort of product release centered uh, work. So that covers actually a much bigger part of our world of automation than most people think. Uh, for example, in uh, in hospitals right now, a lot of the stress on systems is just scaling up existing business as usual, you know, admissions, uh, workflow of prescriptions, deployment of machines. They're not releasing any products, believe me. That's, uh, that's not the main concern right now. But there is a lot of stress and use of processes like the ones that uh, SAFE is trying to address in systems like that. So you see it in government a lot. Uh, all companies have these kind of BAU processes that are separate from that. And uh, one thing that Dan and I have talked about in the past is, you know, maybe for some of these things, the site reliability engineering is the better approach. But on the other hand, you miss out on some of the things in SAFE if you bail out of the SAFE principles and try to solve problems there. So that's something to come to at the end of this talk when we get there. So just to give you an idea of uh, kind of where this approach is maturing into, uh, I've only, I'm only certified as a sort of uh, simplified uh, uh, semi-dummy agilist, uh, and actually on 4.5, which is the last release of this product. And you can know a lot more about this, obviously, by you know seeking out these other certifications, which deal with different facets of it. So. It's probably debatable for people on the outside of SAFE whether all these things are necessary, but it is necessary if you think of, uh, if you buy into this, which a lot of big companies have, you need uh, to kind of specialize in different facets of this. So uh, I think this is kind of a little bit outside of the ops question unless you say, wait a minute, aren't implementing this thing, and you look at the things involved in this, it really is not developer stuff. So maybe it is related to ops in some respects. So the core values they like to talk about are worth reciting here. So by alignment, they're trying to say, you know, align the principles across the teams, integrate fully across all of the aspects of the platform. Their, their idea of transparency is to have artifacts that are produced as part of the SAFE process that let everyone see what the goals are, the artifacts, share things fully across the teams, uh, a lot of what you'll see here is about trying to reduce cycle time, uh, expose what the features of new releases are going to be, and the evaluations of those things, so different teams can see what each people are, what what the other teams are working on, and also recognize the feedback from customers because the supposedly you get frequent feedback with customers with much smaller increments of effort than you would get in a waterfall uh, execution, and then. The way that you execute the program, they have very specific notions about this, uh, which you know, I kind of boil this down to one slide, which is kind of unfair, but I do it anyway. So not this is really not a safe thing, but by try to, they try to make the point of what the focus of uh, safe is uh, by, con by contrasting uh, what they, they prefer. So they would prefer individuals and interactions of individuals over processes and tools. Well, that's kind of ironic, right, since this whole thing is a tool or a process. Uh, but they're, they're, what they're trying to say there is uh, if the customer says, hey, wait a minute, you got this feature all wrong, everybody needs to stop what they're doing on that team and recalibrate what they're doing in an agile way and turn it around instead of having everybody go in the wrong direction with that. So they're saying, that piece of information is going to surface that individual interactions. Then you let the process take over what you're going to do with it. So working software over documentation, okay, that kind of reveals the 
developer preference over the ops preference. So, you know, that's an issue to consider. Uh, yeah, contracts are going to be secondary to collaboration with customers. So customers may not like that because they want to tie you to an SLA. But an SLA in this uh, scheme of things is really not possible because what you want to be measuring is what you're able to produce in the increments according to what you agreed to in the uh, program plan. So what those things are is kind of out, out of the scope of this conversation, but it's it's the preference in this manifesto. Uh, oh yeah, responding to change, right? That's sort of a truism. Let's see, so this, I'll let you just skim through this, but if we look at this from an ops point of view, uh, I think changing requirements, that, that really affects operations considerations. So, I mean, I think if you look at what's going on with COVID-19 across a lot of enterprises today, I mean, I could just use as an example what's going on at Synchrony. We're having to uh, put a lot of people in bring your own device uh, settings and do it in a hurry. And this is uh, having to happen in a... <laughs> On a scale of you know 5,000 users over a couple of weeks' time, a lot of these people are non-technical folks that need to be uh, taught how to do that and to be able to operate from home on short notice. So the the operational challenges around doing that are considerable. I think you could use a developer-like model for that, but it's debatable whether safe really um, what supports that in a direct sort of way. So. I leave that as an open question. I, I think the face-to-face -face emphasis when when I was going through this a year and a half ago, I was a real skeptic of that. So <laughs> I think I mentioned to Dan early on, uh, it'll be interesting to see where the safe people take this now that face-to-face -face is uh, meaning a virtual face-to-face -face thing, because they really do mean people in a meeting, if uh, in a physical meeting. If you see the pictures they uh, they give you in this uh, in this presentation, it'll always be a bunch of people in a room. Uh, not necessarily for the sprints and the stand-ups, but for these uh, product owner um, release train settings where the requirements are getting defined and where the uh, relationships between the teams, which involve security typically, are, are more prominent. Uh, there is uh, more of a focus on sustainable development uh, here they mean sustainable, not in the ecological sense, but I think it's useful to try to insert that dual meaning here. So I always do that when I see this. Okay. So there's a little more to these principles. Uh, the one that I think, uh, there are a couple of these that I'll highlight here for, for the purpose of this discussion. Um, and the two that I would highlight are number six and seven. So uh, this thing about visualizing WIP, and it sounds a little technical, uh, but <laughs> uh, there's really pretty good uh, uh, quantitative uh, measurement support and support in the field for what they're after here. And uh, really the benefit over waterfall isn't just this kind of breakup of the serial left or right process or the challenge of, you know, trying to define everything in advance, which you get with waterfall. It really is this problem of trying to reduce lead time and have these smaller tasks be more manageable. So, you know, it's basically this, this thing of having smaller pieces that can be recombined, recombined and reconfigured dynamically gives you more flexibility and efficiency. So how you do that, you know, in sec uh, and address security, how the security overlays fit into that specifically is what I try to deal with in later slides. Well, number seven, we'll, I'll look into that in a later slide. So this is one of their uh, uh, slides, and it kind of begs the question, you know, if you look at these uh, silos across, you know, here on the right side of the slide, this is a challenge, right? These uh, silos are real. Operations is sitting there in a silo by itself. You know, here we are, security, we're in our separate SIG, right? Uh, how do we interact with each of these silos? How does SAFE address this? You know, they they tackle it. And whether they're successful or not is really the question we want to ask. So the Deming cycle is this 
plan, do, check, act. This is the way I tend to remember it, but uh, this is a real basic uh, uh, capability, what a process underpinning for for the safe process. It's, I think, one of the things I really get right about this. On the other hand, think about how do you do this if we're, with your whole enterprise or your whole product line, uh, you know, like we have uh, our retail card operation or uh, our commercial bank, you know, we want to change a whole checking application. This could be a thing that has you know, really tight integration with third parties, with, you know, some of it might be mainframe based stuff. Some of it is uh, CNCF products that are vertically integrated with other tools. This whole thing exists as a working artifact from an operator's point of view. How do you do plan, do, check, act for this gnarly mess? The other thing they postulate is this notion of the program increment planning. So we, we have these things, it happens. Uh, as you can see, they'd like to depict this as a physical meeting with, you know, people writing stuff up on whiteboards and, you know, having face-to-face -face discussions about you know, what requirements ought to be, uh, teams taking responsibility for different things, challenging uh, stories that uh, people are offering for how long they think uh, story points ought to uh, be represented uh, stakeholders, you know, need to be put into what, not direct conflict, but at least direct negotiations, you know, that if you try to do that in email or in, you know, traditional requirements writing through technical writers, they argue that can't happen. You really want them in a face-to-face -face, uh, setting where these things can get challenged and, and negotiated. I, you know, I think they're onto something with that, but, uh, you know, I have some questions about it. So the questions are on the right part of this slide. Stuff in italics is, you know, requirements engineering depends on story fidelity. Do people know how to write them? Uh, that's a big question in my mind. Story fidelity is uh, more art than design patterns. You know, can you really use the design patterns you get? Like people on this call, I think, are really highly proficient with design patterns, both from being coders themselves and, you know, from this combination of academic training and and being good practitioners and learning from mistakes. Uh, but writing a user story, that's another thing. How do you get better at that? How do you recognize a good one? Uh, and really the whole thing drives from this story fidelity problem. And there's the other problem that security is kind of a bit player in all this. And privacy and compliance maybe has a bigger role to play in some applications, but uh, it's more to say on this particular issue in later slides here. SAFE has this notion of an architectural runway. You know, you could argue that uh, CNCF, you know, has its own kind of architectural runway, which involves trying to leverage existing, you know, CNCF design patterns or maybe, uh, you know, guidelines for how to move from incubator to, uh, you know, full acceptance into the framework. It could also mean, you know, there's a de facto habit about which you know, already fully embraced tools, i.e. popular tools that are in the CFCM, uh, CNCF family, you know, that are part of the runway. So that could be seen as, you know, either features in which you import the tools and the APIs from things in the landscape, or you could be, these could be inside the enterprise where feature being features are being brought to you by uh, practitioners that are uh, advocates for particular applications inside your own um, your own enterprise. So, yeah, what this means, this is kind of another a challenge, I think. They also have this notion of what the value stream is. Uh, you know, I think I touched on this delay-based uh, optimization. So this matters for operations people, right? Uh, they're mainly, when you learn about this, they mainly are going to give you the analogy of developers you know, waiting to get specifications or developers waiting to get uh, feedback from testers uh, or uh, information from other other teams. And these delays, you know, introduce problems that you can only address by making the queue sizes and the work in process quantity smaller so that you can manage it. I think is, there's something to this, but the question is how do real operation issues like latency you know, scalability, robustness, uh, you know, team constraints, like what you do at the end of shifts and 
how do you manage when you're doing migrations or tool upgrades, which we see this a lot in security tooling that um, when you want to do a rollout of a new version of a tool, uh, that has a big ops impact. So how do you model these things in SAFE is sort of a question. Continuous exploration is, you know, as you see in this chart, depicted as, uh, you know, one of the, the roles in this, but I think it's a little fuzzy in SAFE how you integrate this. There's a role for for R&D, you know, like going to our friends at NYU or going to the professional associations like IEEE or to NIST or to the consortia to figure out how to do, you know, better ways to do this. Maybe you look at, you know, other CNCF tools and say, see, how did they solve this in Tough or how did they solve this in, um, you know, the, one of the telemetry projects that, uh, you know, it's got a solution space at Slimber, the one I'm taking on. I think this is a little fuzzy, but this is kind of a key thing for ops because I think one of the more powerful principles here is the design patterns. So cadence and synchronization is the other thing I want to uh, call out here. I'll let you skim this, but uh, cadence and synchronization, these are really important for operations. You know, it looks like a fancy expression here to call it this, but sometimes it's like, you know, the shift boundaries for um, when people come to work and when uh, they hand off work. Sometimes it's incident-based considerations like, oh man, here's a, a, a zero day associated with uh, a stretch vulnerability, and there's a whole bunch of CNCF projects that have this in it, what do we do? You know, now you've got the press involved in it, you have uh, ops people who have to be taken off their current roles to address that. So the cadence and all of this stuff, you can use, uh, mean that you can implement SAFE to try to do some of these things, but it's really different from a release-driven planning session. So we're, you know, in the SEC DevOps world, or op, uh, we are a little struggling still with how to have uh, security teams uh, implementing SAFE to do this. It, it's doable, but it's, uh, it's not always a good fit. So if I had to pick one thing, you know, out of the whole safe thing, uh, it would be this, iterate toward the sustainably shortest lead time with the best quality and value. So I think, you know, stick to this principle, try to apply it to ops. This is probably going to be the most help. So I hear this a lot, um, you know, should we do security first? So th this is me in the slide. Uh, <coughs> I really feel strongly about this, that, one of the most pernicious, pernicious things that gets said is security needs to be designed in at the beginning. I I'm, I think that is so upside down. Uh, the, the thing about SAFE is the stakeholders in applications are the people who need the applications. The customers, unless you're building a security tool, don't want that. So I really want to you know, turn that around and say, look, it's it's the applications that rule. And in the ops world, it's whatever the operation is that you need to support. So if right, if right now it's running the, you know, the supply of ventilators in a hospital, it's the, you know, the workflow for that, it's the queue management, you know, it's the staffing related to running those operations, you know, it's the shift handoff, it's the security around, um, you know, around new processes. So it's those applications, it's, it's not the security. So. Not to say security isn't important, it's just that it takes on a, a different role than what we're used to. So operations, you know, maybe jumping ahead to the last point on this slide, operations can work as applications, but it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. So uh, the point really here is that security comes later. You let your, the, the point of this is let the the uh, the teams, the application teams say what they need from their customers and the stakeholders, bring in the security and privacy uh, aspects of this later on through the architecture enablers. So, so my reality check on this is, you know, 20% of the defects remain after you do static and dynamic scans. We don't know how to produce bug-free software, so get over it. Uh, the goal of trying to produce secure code really subtracts from our more important objectives, which are sustainability, manageability, risk, usability, maintainability, and what the customer needs from the application in the first place. So that's where SAFE says we need enablers. Let's see, we got 12 minutes or so. I'll wrap this up in five minutes so we can talk about it. Okay. 
So how? Yeah, go ahead. Nope. Sorry, just agreeing. Understood. Five minutes and we'll call time. Got it. So how does SAFE support this? Uh, frequent iteration, automated testing, shorter sprints, trying to left shift, test development, uh, really trying to make security be part of the quality dimension. So that's really the movement. So this is uh, this is me touting this. Uh, mostly I think this insight is external to SAFE. Uh, some of this needs to happen at the sprint retrospectives. Um, the enablers in different enterprises have different life cycles. You may have to bring these into your own projects. Uh, some of this is, you know, well, what is cut and paste for security? Uh, and what is the role of domain-specific languages? And, you know, bringing that to, in, to pl into play into your security teams. Test engineering, you know, is, the new way to think about this is security is test and vice versa. Frequent demos should be including test integration. This means usually uh, left shifting to developers, trying to build this capability into the integrated uh, developer environments, probably Eclipse. Uh, more tagging and annotation. I'm gonna skip this one in the interest of time. I think we tend to underestimate the securities of specialization. It's not covered well in college level software engineering. It, uh, you know, we really ought to think about it the way a rheumatologist thinks about a neurologist. It's, it's an adjacent specialization. They're both in medicine, but neurologists don't pretend to know what rheumatologists know. Uh, what that means is, you know, your average developer is not going to be a security specialist. We shouldn't expect that. So likewise, from an operations point of view, uh, we're not going to understand what Akamai or Palo Alto firewall specialists are going to do. Also, you know, some hardening is going to require aggressive red teaming. Uh, that's really kind of a new concept. I don't think SAFE has baked that in. It offers a paradigm for doing that, but they don't really give us a good roadmap for it. Um, a key thing for our ops integration here is how to figure out how to mix legacy and software-defined data centers under the same framework. So I'm going to rant here against teaching toys like zero trust and trying to do what Google can do, and you know even PayPal will call them out here, you know, or synchrony. You know, companies of a certain size can do things that most organizations can't. In fact, most CNCF projects probably can't operate that way. So um, part of what we need to be thinking about uh, our security tooling as as performing for us is supporting uh, decision support. So what we mean by that is, you know, being fully part of partners with quality writ large, providing telemetry into support decision making. Sometimes that'll be for security in incidents, uh, but there could be other kinds of things. It could be that, you know, we need meta models to support our scalability or simulation goals, or it could be to teach how things work so people can learn how applications are designed. Um, we may, be, we may, may need to be able to integrate risk in a more systematic way into decision support tools. So to do that, you know, there are uh, operation support tools that are out there, you know, and building an integrated integration with that with our, you know, against, existing CNCF applications is maybe something we could think about uh, on a more systematic basis than we do now. You know, I got a whole other a presentation about security and big data from my work at, at NIST. I think we need to start thinking of application data as secondary to security data that, you know, for most applications these days, if we could, we would be gathering more data than the application itself is accumulating. So the question is, how do we do this security analytics uh, moving closer to data science than uh, just purely, you know, sending log in, log off, and, you know, resource consumption logs off the Splunk. There are big issues on human-computer interaction for operations. Uh, re you know, how we use repos, how do we discover what's in repos, what the design patterns are for operations. You can do these things in sprints, but the problem is they're often not introduced. So, you know, ask yourself, how does the CNCF community get brought into the ecosystem? Uh, do, do we have an ops repo? Is this, is this even a teachable thing? Hey, Mark, I'm a key... just going to temporarily yeah. call the hard stop. I just wanted to follow up on a question I posted in chat. Uh, does anyone have right. any topics they want to bring up for the open floor? 
Because if not, we yeah, can... yeah. Let me just uh, let me go to the last slide here, sure. So that we've got the contact stuff. So I'll put this up on SlideShare at some point, um, but we can stop here. Fine. Thank you, Mark. Jumping back to this, uh, are there any open floor topics, or does anyone have anything they want to bring up with with respect to Mark's presentation? Uh, uh, so this is Vinay here. I had a question, uh, Mark. I think your uh, the story that you're trying to convey is uh, well received. So. What is the next step? I mean, what are you hoping to achieve? I mean, how do we incorporate this? Is this something for CNCF to try to think about as we develop our projects? Is that what you're trying to convey? Or what is your broader strategy on, on evangelizing and, and, and also from an adoption perspective? Yeah, spot on. And I don't, I don't know the answer to that. What I think is, you know, this group in CNCF is thought leaders, you know, both by deed and by actions. So yeah, I would like to see us take some of the principles, you know, it doesn't need to be the whole thing either, right? Um, you know, find a role for CNCF projects. Some of them in particular, you know, like Tough have a role to play in this. And, uh, you know, but maybe have some artifacts and, you know, maybe periodic uh, FAQ kind of presentation sessions so that, you know, people who come through this process could review some of this and say, okay, I see how I can contribute to, you know, decision support or making better user stories or uh, integrating, you know, safety aspects into uh, future standups. Because, you know, the review that we get for accessioning, of, you know, through the CNCF process that I'm aware of anyway, is only going to touch on some of the security elements. But, you know, I'm, I don't have the whole answer to that question. What do you think, Dan? Yeah, I mean, just just to uh, you know tie back, uh, you know how how we got here to to have this discussion. Um, you know, this this came out of uh, you know uh, discussions that we had around uh, operators and extending you know the work that we're doing in the CNTF and especially um, you know getting to. Uh, help and facilitate in the journey of some of these leading edge, um, you know, projects that are in the CNCF. Um, you know, many of them are created in a greenfields uh, environment. They're, you know, built in cloud native by distributed teams. Um, so, like, you're seeing organizational and systemic advantages, uh, you know, uh, out of the box in some of those things. And then you, um, you know, try to apply those practices to larger organizations that uh, don't have that luxury, that, that come from, um, you know, situations where you can conceivably get everybody together and, uh, you know, do some hard uh, negotiating to work out uh, all the differences. Um, it's an extraordinarily messy process, uh, asynchronously or synchronously, even, you know, it's exacerbated, uh, you know, asynchronously. And uh, I think that, um, you know, any uh, leader that has the opportunity to take the simpler route uh, to, to, you know, deliver a more high fidelity uh, answer will take the simpler route. Um, and, and that is you know, totally, you know, that, that in-person, uh, you know, quorum. Uh, uh, but, woof. Like it's hard, uh, even inside of an organization these days, uh, to you know gather uh, enough folks to uh, drive meeting. You you might get one meeting where, unless you have you know huge pressure from top down uh, that everybody has to push through it. And uh, you know from uh, you know I'll, I'll put on my opinioning hat. Um, you know, the, the reality in my experience is it takes more people effort, not less people effort. And that's the existential challenge that, uh, you know, we're 
uh, seeing in, in moving to you know, broader, more distributed, virtualized uh, environments is, is you know, we're, we're looking for uh, easier solutions with less resources. And unfortunately, in my experience, the answer is it's more time, more effort uh, with more people to uh, you know, get the right answer in that uh, distributed environment. And I haven't seen um, the leadership see changes um, with leaders that know what a uh, distributed reality looks like and what success looks like in the distributed environment uh, for me to, uh, you know, really, uh, uh, you know, see that, that existential uh, challenge, uh, pressure coming off of it. You know, folks are going to keep pushing to you know, the easiest solution, you know, in-person uh, meetings while, um, you know, uh, other forces are pulling in the other direction, and uh, um, it's, it's great to have you know context. Uh, but you know, um, we're, we're going to be battling this for for you know quite a number of years. Yeah, no, thank you both. Yeah, I, I agree. It's it's amazing how we battle these things every day, and it's just so hard every to mm -hmm. organically bring that uh, security mindset and change. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, the the thing is about these composable, whether we call it, you know, sprints or composable services, um, you can bring small things into these meetings as long as they're doable. So, you know, some of this is as simple as, hey, if you lo look at the API and point to a CNCF project and say, you know, here is a design pattern for solving that. And what you've done is sort of bring in a whole paradigm as part of a solution. So, yeah, you know, I, I think Vinay asked, you know, you're asking the right question here, which is, you know, how do we do, because it's a teaching enterprise as much as anything, you know, how can we leverage what the knowledge base implicit in the software products that are in the suite here, uh, but at the same time, learn from the people who are using it, right? To let them use these big frameworks like Scaled Agile to, for deployments, like maybe it needs to be a catalog, you know, of resources that uh, like SIG Security could host or, you know, catalog, I don't know, some combination of those maybe. Right. Yeah, I think it's, you know, great to put things, uh, you know, things into perspective and, uh, you know, definitely want to, you know, balance out our sort of future looking, um, you know, uh, work with you know some of the you know you know hard reality applied on the ground uh, understanding of, of how we put this into practice. Um, so this has been a great perspective, Mark. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Matthew. Uh, our facil meeting facilitator had to drop, uh, so I'll uh, close this out for today. Um, and, uh, you know, dur during the meeting, uh, I did hear from uh, Sarah Allen, so I was uh, you know, happy to hear from, from her. Uh, she was in the process of uh, going and evaluating, uh, getting uh, COVID-19 testing. Um, you know, for better or for worse, uh, she um, was too healthy to get tested. Um, you know, I've you know, a number of grumbles with, with that, but that's, that's where we're at collectively. Uh, so, um, you know, she, she's, uh, you know, healthy and, and, and doing all right, um, you know, uh, stuck in Boston, uh, unable to, you know, uh, return to, to San Francisco, um, you know, with the rest of her family. So, uh, uh, I, again, uh, apologize for any delays that we uh, may encounter, um, you know, uh, in managing through everything. Uh, our first priority is keeping everybody healthy and safe. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll wrap up for, for this week, and I hope everyone uh, stays healthy and safe, and uh, see you next week. Thanks. Do well, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks. Take care.